Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to week seven of OCHEM 1 weekly reviews. Um, we are going to cover um, SN1, SN2 uh, more in depth uh, this week compared to last week. Uh, so just a brief recap of last week. We, you know, went over exam one and kind of uh, reviewed uh, on like what to do uh, and how to prepare for exam two. Uh, we looked at uh, the contents of exam two. We looked at, we started with chapter four, uh, just briefly mentioning initiation, propagation, termination. Um, and we also went over free radical halogenation, uh, how to chlorinate, how to brominate. And there's one thing I forgot to mention, which is NBS. Uh, which we're going to take a look at uh, this week. Um, other than that, we also um, we talked a little bit about uh, how a uh, mechanism works, and we'll review that uh, at the start of this week. And uh, along with uh, that, we're going to go in depth with SN1, SN2, comparing SN1 versus SN2, what a how what a nucleophile is, how to determine its strength, and uh, what a solvent is, and how to determine if it's protic or aprotic. Okay, and then next week we'll get into E1, E2. So yeah. All right. So let's get started. So now. Okay. So real quick. Talking about um, NBS. Okay. So, like I said, NBS is going to be one moment. Sorry, it looks like the stylus is not working, so I'm trying to figure that out. Let me refresh. Draw. All right, so we're gonna try to, I'm just gonna try to use my finger and we'll see how that goes. All right, so again, NBS, uh, let's say you have some molecule, and I'll, I'll say, uh, and in fact, let's do this right here. Okay, let's say N, B, S, and it'll also give light. Uh, so NBS is going to be a, a um, low concentrated brumination. Okay. So it's very similar to um, brumination. Uh, so you do the exact same thing. The product will look exactly the same as if this was uh, Br2HB. So again, any you know halogenation, you always have to find out your most stable radical point. And uh, before that, you have to you know identify all your uh, possible radical positions. It's gonna be right there, there, and there. And then label all of your positions. This is primary allylic. This is secondary allylic. And this is primary. Okay, and obviously the other two are secondary vanillic, which is obviously going to be very unstable. 
So based on this, I have primary, primary, and secondary, um, and then I have two allelic. So resonance trumps everything. And then between my two resonance, secondary is better than primary according to my radical stability trend. So I'm going to choose this point right here, and my product will look like this. Okay. All right, so hopefully that should be a review. Uh, maybe not NBS, but like the concept of brumination and finding radicals and labeling them. Um, so yeah, we'll get into uh, SN1. Is right here. Uh, actually, before we get into SN1, I actually wanted to talk about SN2 first. Okay, so we'll talk about SN2 real quick. So I found this neat little uh, diagram uh, explaining how steric hindrance is really important uh, to SN2. So, uh, and in today's uh, review, I'll talk about, uh, I'll draw at the very end of this, I'll, uh, so I'll go over SN2 and then I'll go over SN1. And then at the end of this, I'll compare SN1 versus SN2 in a table format. Um, one of the determining factors comparing SN1 and SN2 is going to be the position of the substrate, whether it's in a tertiary, uh, secondary, primary, or a methyl halide. Uh, as you can see right here, methyl bromide, ethyl, isopropyl, t-butyl, all of these are going to be methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. And then it's showcasing you, uh, you know, what's going on spatially. So if you have a methyl, you have your carbon that's gray, uh, dark gray, and then your hydrogens are the lighter gray. And then this is your uh, bromine atom. Um, so as you can see, a methyl has very little steric hindrance compared to having three uh, methyl groups attached to that carbon. So there's very little room, um, and in fact, it's uh, completely blocked, as this diagram says, um, for a nucleophile to come in from the back and attack that position, right? So that's why we prefer something that is less sterically hindered. Um, so the nucleophile has more easier access to reaching that uh, backside carbon. Okay. All right. So before we get started, I'm going to quickly go over the diagram, uh, the free, the energy diagram of SN1 and then uh, how that is important to um, its reaction. So we have this right here. We have uh, energy right here. And we have reaction coordinate. OK. Uh, this should be free energy. Again, please be patient with me as I have to use my finger and not because the stylus is not working. Um, so you have your reactants right here, transition state, and then your products right here. Okay, so P, R, and then transition state, T, S, 1. Okay, uh, so this is going to be SN2 because SN2 has only two, uh, sorry, one step. So SN2 has one step. So the leaving group leaving and the nucleophile attacking all occurs in one step. Um, so there is no formation of a carbocation intermediate. The carbocation will exist, but it won't uh, occupy that much time or energy uh, going through the SN2 reaction pathway. OK? All right, so let's move on. I'm going to 
zoom out a little bit or zoom in. Okay. So SN2 um, reaction rate uh, determines on several factors, which we'll get into. And uh, before I get into that, notice how I said the rate of SN2, or like the percent of SN, percentage of SN2 occurring. Okay, so that means, and I'll type this out. So in any given reaction, you will have a major product and minor product. Okay, so you could have. Uh, so, for example, you could have seventy percent favoring SN one, and thirty percent of the factors favoring SN two. Okay. Or you could have 60% uh, favoring SN, SN1, 20% favoring E1, and 20% favoring E2. Okay? Now, obviously, don't uh, worry about like the percentages too much and like the how greater it is. Uh, just know you have you may have minor and major products. Okay, you will never have example. Uh, you'll never have hundred percent S N two or hundred percent S N one, and then etc. Okay, as an E1, E2. Okay, at least as far as I know. Again, um, always double check, but from what I know, you will always have a mixture of uh, mechanisms that can occur. Okay, again, you'll have major and minor products. Okay, this is a similar concept to resonance uh, somewhat. Okay, so each factor of the reaction will push towards a certain mechanism, okay? Your nucleophile, if it's strong, it's gonna favor SN2. If it's weak, it's gonna favor SN1, okay? So if the nucleophile is strong, it's gonna push that percentage higher for SN2, okay? How much does it uh, affect it or how big of a role certain aspects have, uh, you don't necessarily need to, need to worry about that. Um, but we'll look at several factors, okay? So the first thing is uh, position of our, position of um, the position of leaving group, okay? So is my position in a tertiary, uh, secondary, primary, or a methyl, okay? So again, like we just discussed right here, methyl and primary are gonna be the more favorable uh, uh, conditions for SN2, okay? So this, I'm gonna quickly write this out, okay? And something we haven't talked about is SN2 will SN2 will never uh, react with a leaving group adjacent to a quaternary uh, carbon, okay? And I'll explain um, what that looks like. So let's say you have uh, this example. Uh, 
Actually, let me just. So even though my bromine, my leading group is on a primary carbon, which is which does favor SN2, but this leading group is really is next to a bulky uh, electron uh, cloud. Uh, it's next to a quaternary carbon. Okay, uh, so this is obviously very uh, sterically hindering the position of uh, the leading group. So when the carbocation um, appears and we're trying to attack with our nucleophile, all of this uh, electron clouds will like uh, be sterically hindering this. Okay, so we don't want that. So that's another aspect of uh, SN2 you have to uh, keep in the back of your mind. Okay. Um, so SN2 is obviously very big on steric hindrance, okay? Uh, you might have heard that terminology in Unit 1. Uh, hopefully you have already heard it in Unit 2 in lecture. If not, again, I'll repeat it. It's called steric hindrance, okay? So it is spatially, um, you know, ster sterics relate to, you know, if it's going, you know, up, or down, or like in, in, in space, it's, it's not like 2D, right? So spatially, uh, that nucleophile is going to have a hard time uh, attacking and reaching the, the electrophile, okay? All right, number two is uh, nucleophile. So we need our nucleophile to be a strong um, position, uh, a, a strong nucleophile compared to a weak, uh, as weak will favor SN1. And then, um, and then uh, the solvent, it's how, uh, if it's protic or aprotic conditions, what type of solution uh, are uh, nucleophile is in, that will also affect it, and we'll get into that all, all that later. Okay. Um, and the, the leaving group also matters, but uh, the leaving group uh, a factor affects all SN, all mechanisms, SN1, SN2, E1, E2, all equally. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that. Okay. So we already talked about uh, the position of the leaving group and with that diagram. So keep that in mind. So now nucleophile. So some things to know is the letter the nucleophile, um, the faster the rate of SN2 reactions, okay? So again, term, uh, the wording is very important. The faster the rate of SN2 reactions, okay? Notice how it didn't say if it's a strong nucleophile, it will only do SN2. It just says SN2 reaction will perform faster than SN1 or any, some of the other ones, okay? All right, so good nucleophiles are also good electron donors, okay? All right, so now we'll discuss what a good nucleophile looks like. So let's take Na. OCH3. Um, KOCH3 and ethanol, which is CHO, CH3OH. Okay. So same thing, I'm just uh, so OCH3 is always there, but the only thing I'm adding 
are, are replacing is sodium, potassium, and hydrogen. Okay, these three are going to be uh, almost always, like 95% of the time or 90% of the time, always included in your new uh, in your nucleophile. Okay, so. In order for it to be a strong nucleophile, it has to be Na or K. Okay? In order for it to be weak, it's going to contain hydrogen. Okay? And again, we discussed this already last week. Um, the reason why these affect uh, sodium and potassium are strong and hydrogen is weak is because of a gen chem concept called strong electrolytes and ionic bonds. So sodium and potassium, if you'll notice on your periodic table, are um, in groups one, I believe. Let me quickly pull it up. So yeah, uh, sodium and potassium are in group one, uh, and any bond formed in, in with those atoms will form a ionic bond, which means that when they are bonded to OCH3, okay, these bonds will be completely severed, okay, where you'll have a positive charge here, positive charge here, and a complete negative charge here, okay, as opposed to if once you're bonded to OCH3, right here you're gonna have a partial positive charge here okay so you're not gonna get a full positive charge here um, and you're not gonna get a full negative here okay so the negative might be uh, sorry so the negative is going to be a partial negative so I'll write that down so this is a complete separation of charge, and this is going to be a partial separation of charge, okay? All right, so that is how to uh, determine if your nucleophile is strong or weak. Uh, so this factor is really important. It really determines uh, a lot of your, you know, identifying if it's SN1, SN2, E1, or E2, because um, position of the uh, substrate really, or position of the leaving group should be easier than identifying uh, uh, strength of your nucleophile. Uh, so I want to make sure you guys really understand it. Uh, if you guys ever have questions, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, to, um, you know, your professor, your TA, uh, peer tutoring, PLTL, SI, anyone. Um, so yeah. Okay. Next we're gonna talk about polar protic and aprotic solvents. Okay. So all of your solvents are gonna be polar. And again, polar means there's going to be a dipole moment within the compound. Um, and protic, so we'll talk about protic and aprotic. Okay? So protic solvents, um, Uh, here are the examples of protic solvents. You're going to have H2O, uh, methanol. So I'm going to write ME uh, because it stands for meth uh, uh, methyl. And you, it's a good habit to get used to that language because you might see it uh, on a practice exam or on your real quiz slash exam. So ME stands for meth uh, methyl. ET stands for ethyl, 
Um, so methanol, ethanol, carboxic acid. Okay. So all of these are going to be protic solvents. Okay. So if you take a guess on what all of these have in common, you can notice that they all have a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, okay? And that obviously forms a hydrogen bond, okay? So, uh, and real quick, protic solvents favor SN1 and aprotic solvents favor SN2, okay? So going back to our protic solvents, water, methanol, ethanol, carboxic acid, they all contain a OH, okay? Now, if I have a nucleophile, um, with a negative charge, okay? My OHs and are gonna cluster around the nucleophile um, and react with it and lower its energy, okay? Which means to, um, so it's, it's, it's essentially going to stabilize uh, my nucleophile, okay? So let me scroll down. Okay. So let's say you have ROH, okay, you have a dipole here that's bonded to your nucleophile like this, okay? So this is going to, it's going to stabilize it, okay? Because my nucleophile is charged, which is obviously unstable, uh, but we want our nucleophile to have a strong negative charge. A strong negative charge allows for it to react with a strong positive charge uh, contained in our leaving group uh, or electrophile, okay? Uh, and I, I know this might be a little bit conceptually challenging compared to the other concepts uh, we talked about so far, uh, but just bear with me. I'm trying to really make sure you guys are understanding the conceptual portion of it and just not memorizing certain solvents or certain nucleophiles. Um, but yeah, so again, this dipole moment from alcohols formed and these solvents are going to have a dipole moment um, and that positive, partial positive charge is going to help stabilize the, uh, un, uh, the charge, negative charge nucleophile, okay? Um, and when it helps stabilize it, it reduces the negative charge, okay? And we don't want uh, the negative charge to reduce because it's going to, nu the nucleophile is going to uh, uh, reduce its reactivity, okay? As opposed to our aprotic solvents, we have um, acetone, which is essentially a ketone. Okay, so ketone. We have something called DMF, which is dimethyl um, uh, form, format form amide, which is a hydrogen here, and then N, and then with two methyl groups on the nitrogen. So this is called DMF. Uh, we also have DMSO, which is dimethyl sulfoxide, which is basically a ketone, but with uh, sulfur instead of carbon. Uh, so yeah, DMF, DMSO, acetone, uh, these are going to be your most typical ones uh, that you might see. Uh, again, this is DMSO, that stands for dimethyl sulfoxide, and DMF stands for dimethyl form amide. OK, 
Okay. So these are, if you see so those solvents, they are going to favor SN2. Okay, so let me try to zoom out a little bit. Okay. So again, protic solvents can form hydrogen bonding, and the hydrogen bonding will attack my nucleophile and weaken it. Okay, and again, weak nucleophiles uh, favors SN1 reactions, and strong nucleophiles favor SN2 reactions. Okay. So these acetone, DMSO, DMF, they are incapable of forming a hydrogen bonding uh, and bonding with our nucleophile. So my nucleophile stays strong and it doesn't uh, reduce its reactivity, with, um, you know, therefore not reducing SM2's uh, reaction rate, okay? All right. So SN2 will also uh, be slow in nonpolar solvents. So for example, like a benzene ring, a just a carbon tetrachloride, just a single carbon chain, anything that's nonpolar, it is also going to uh, not thrive in um, SN2 reactions. So also keep that in mind. And again, the reason is uh, hydrogen bonding with the nucleophile can occur, which slows down the reaction. So we don't want that. So just to recap, uh, SN2 uh, conditions, um, it needs our substrate to uh, be on a methyl or primary. Uh, so those are going to be uh, the ideal conditions. Secondary is also okay, uh, and tertiary is going to be very, very, very slow. Um, nucleophile, we want it to have a negative charge rather than be neutral. So you might have a question regarding uh, a ranking question, asking for it to rank the nucleophiles in terms of SN2, uh, or sometimes they don't even say SN2, they'll, they'll just say rank by nucleophilicity. Uh, yeah, and then you can also uh, you also have to look at your leaving group, um, where iodine is the best leaving group uh, because it's able to contain it's able to contain that negative charge a lot better than bromine, and bromine is better containing that negative charge compared to chlorine. And then lastly, you have to look at your solvent. Uh, it needs to be polar and aprotic for it to favor SN2. Okay. All right, so now we'll get into SN1. Um, something I actually forgot to mention for SN2 is um, SN2 has a, well, once it's attacks, so let's see. So let's say you have your nickel power right here, negative charge and you have your leaving group like this. When the nucleophile attacks from here, it's attacking from the back side, my reaction is going to have a inversion of stereochemistry. Okay? So don't forget that. So stereochemistry of the leaving group will flip, okay? So this is called inversion, okay? So you might recognize that word um, in, in your lecture or PLTL sessions or SI sessions. So just uh, don't forget that word. Uh, it just means to flip from a wedge to a dash or a dash to a wedge. Um, Whereas SN1, you'll have both uh, wedges and dashes. You'll get like an antimer of each other. Um, so usually in SN1, you just keep the same stereochemistry. Or you can write both and you'll be completely right, uh, depending on what your professor wants and what they decide to uh, make the rule for this semester. Um, so yeah. 
Okay. So, and again, SN2 is a one-step reaction where the leaving group leaving and nucleophile attacking all happens in one step, whereas SN2, it will occur in two steps. Okay? So, SN2, the leaving group leaving and carbocation forming is one step. So step number one, and step number two is the nucleophile attacking. Okay? So that's how a regular SN1 reaction works. Uh, for SN1, the trend goes tertiary, secondary, primary, okay? Uh, in fact, SN1, E1, and E2 all follow this trend, okay? All of them are going to favor um, the typical carbocation stability. Uh, it's only in the case of SN2 that's the case where it's completely flipped. Um, let's see. So again, uh, SN1 is a SN1, SN2 are substitution reactions, and uh, that's where the S is coming from. N is coming from the nucleophile, N stands for nucleophile, and the 1 stands for first order, okay? So there is a little bit of rate law and those like kinetics, uh, you know, concepts, but you don't necessarily have to go, in, we don't go in, in, in depth with it, so don't worry about uh, all of that. Uh, so SN1 will follow this rate law. K equals, um, or sorry. Um, so reaction rate will equal K and then electrophile, which is the substrate. Okay. And then SN2, so this is SN1, SN2 will be K electrophile and nucleophile, okay? So E stands for electrophile and N stands for nucleophile. Uh, this is not like an equation, um, like it's not, this is not a divide symbol. Uh, it's just to show the separation of SN1 and SN2. Okay, uh, and as far as the leaving groups, again, uh, just like SN1 and just like uh, all the mechanisms, E1, uh, uh, iodine, iodine is the best, and then bromide, and then chloride, and then fluorine. But the special thing about SN1 and E1 uh, which we haven't gotten to yet. So SN1 has a potential to rearrange. So I'll give an example here. So let's say I have this reaction here. Okay. Okay. So first step is to identify where my nucleophile or where my leaving group is. I notice this on a secondary. I'm going to look at my adjacent carbons, okay, which are those two, and I'm going to see if those carbons contain a higher degree of stability, okay? So can this secondary car, uh, carbocation turn into a tertiary carbocation, okay? So right now, we're looking at this step right here, okay? We're trying to increase the stability of this carbon cation to further push it towards SN1, okay? And if we already know our nucleophile is a weak nucleophile, it's, uh, we kind of already know we're gonna look at SN1 so we can get into the uh, mindset of, okay, let me look for rearrangement possibilities, okay? I'm going to look at my where my carbocation is, and I'm going to look at my adjacent carbons, and I'm going to 
rearrange, uh, and another way of looking at it is swapping. So SN1 can do a hydride or a methyl rearrangement, okay? So it can either, and it'll look like this. You draw a little squiggly line with an H and an arrow, and I draw a little squiggly line with a CH3 and an arrow, and that will showcase the, the swap or rearrangement, okay? So if I, I have two hydrogens here and two methyl groups there, if I swap with another hydrogen uh, at this location, I'm still going to get a secondary carbocation, okay? So this, again, is a secondary carbocation, okay? But if I swap right here, so, okay, if, if my one of my methyls swap, this will get me to a tertiary carbocation, okay? So obviously I am going to prefer the bottom where I'm going to rearrange with a methyl. So all put together, it's going to look like this. Okay. And then the nucleophile can come in and attack. Okay. So now this carbocation is in a more SN1 favoring position, which is why we do this, okay? Uh, and of course, we can also do this with a hydride. Uh, just in this example, we weren't able to. Uh, an example we could do a hydride shift will be this. Um, in this case, we are going to want to do a hydride shift because if we shift the, uh, the methyl, then we're going from a secondary to a secondary. But if we switch with the hydrogen, we're going from a secondary to a tertiary. Okay? So, and then we get two hydrogens right here. Okay? All right, so this rearrangement concept can only happen with SN1 and E1, okay? So again, it can happen with these uh, reactions because it, it forms a carbocation intermediate, okay? And I'll talk about that reaction diagram here. Okay, so for SN1, it's going to look like this. products, reactants, transition state one, transition state two, and then you have your intermediate, which is your carbocation, okay? Okay? So this transition state one is when your leaving group leaves, then you form your carbocation, and then the nucleophile will attack, giving you your final product, okay? That's the two-step process in SN1, okay? And SN2, the leaving group leaving, carbocation forming, and the nucleophile attacking all occurs in one single step, okay? Uh, and that's showcased in the reaction diagram or energy diagram in one transition state and no intermediates, no second transition state. Reactants and products are still the same, um, but yeah. Okay, so for SN1, Again, we want a weak nucleophile, and we want polar uh, protic solvents, okay? And we want it to go from tertiary, secondary, uh, primary, okay? All right, now that we kind of already gone over SN1 and SN2, I'm gonna draw a little table uh, showcasing um, um, the comparison between SN1 and SN2. Uh, so real quick, I'm gonna go back to uh, everything that we've covered so far and see if we 
need to talk about anything uh, or if you guys want to take a screenshot. So there's the NBS. There's the steric hindrance diagram of showing why SN2 favors primary compared to tertiary. There's a free energy diagram of SN2. Uh, I talk a little. I talk a little bit about you know having a major and minor product and position of the leading group, nickel plus strength and solvent favoring uh, SN2 or really even SN1. Um, and then the better the nickel pile, the faster the rate of SN2 reaction. And again, I showed. I talked about how if my leading group is next to a quaternary carbon then it will never react or it will be a very slow reaction. Um, to, so slow that we just say never. Um, and then some good nucleophiles are anything that contains the sodium and potassium because it has a strong negative charge, which neg nucleophiles prefer negative charges versus a partial or no charge. Uh, which is why hydrogen contains, which is why it's weak, which is why it prefers SN1. Then we talked about protic and aprotic solvents. Uh, protic solvents uh, are the following list right there. All of them contain a hydrogen bond, which will react with uh, the nucleophile, uh, stabilizing it and reducing its reactivity. And we don't want nucleophile to lose its negative slash reactivity, okay? So nucleophile resonance and stability is the one time it's bad when we talk about nucleophile, okay? And we'll discuss that whenever we get into ranking questions for nucleophiles, okay? And then uh, we talked about aprotic solvents, which is acetone, DMSO, DMF, just to give a few. Uh, so these are some of the more popular ones. Uh, again, we talked about the inversion of stereochemistry of leading group um, whenever it's SN2. And for SN1, it's going to be the racemic mixture, which means you get a mix of both carbo, uh, of both wedge and a dash. Okay. Uh, then we got into SN1 where we talked about a little bit about the rate law. Uh, SN1 is going to be rate. Uh, times electrophile, SN2 is going to be re-electrophile, nucleophile. Uh, we talked about rearrangement with SN1 uh, and E1. Um, it can do a hydride shift or a methyl shift. So this is a concept that you always have to keep in mind whenever you think in terms of SN1. So in SN1, always think about rearrangement. In SN2, always think about stir hindrance. Okay? And then we talked about the energy diagram of SN1 uh, and how the, there's two transition states, a intermediate carbocation. Yeah. All right. So finally, we're going to go through all the different tools and put it in a nice table format. Uh, so let me just quickly pull up my notes for that. And we'll get started. Sorry, one second. Okay, so All right. So position. So I'm going to write down all the little factors and then we'll discuss 
um, which side it goes on. So position of my bin group nucleophile. file. Solvents. Stereochemistry. Uh, leaving group, resonance, definitely can spell that. Uh, how many steps there are, uh, the rate law. An energy uh, diagram or graph we kind of already discussed. Okay, so in red, I'm going to do SN1. So all of this is going to favor SN1. Okay? All right, and if you guys can, I want you guys to tell me the answer before I get to it. Okay? So position is going to be tertiary, secondary, primary. Nucleophile is going to be weak, solvent is going to be polar um, protic, uh, stereochemistry is going to be racemic mixture, leading group is going to be uh, iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine. Resonance is obviously good. Okay, I'm not talking about resonance of nucleophiles, so don't get that mixed up uh, because earlier I mentioned how resonance affects the nucleophile, but this is resonance on our. Uh, uh, on our electrophile, not on our nucleophile. Okay? It has two steps, and the rate law is K electrophile. Okay? Now to on to SN2. It's going to be primary, secondary, and then very, very weak tertiary. Um, and then it's never going to do never adjacent to ordinary. Okay, it's going to be strong. And it's going to have a polar A product. Uh, stereochemistry is going to be inverted, so we call that inversion. There is no leaving group. Sorry, uh, that's not what I meant. So the leaving group is going to be iodine, bromine, chlorine, fluorine. Resonance is also good. Again, resonance on the electrophile slash carbocation, not on the nucleophile. There's one step, and the rate law is K times electrophile and nucleophile. Okay? So the rate law comes into play and is important whenever they talk about changing you know, the solvent, changing the nucleophile strength, changing the position of our leaving group. They'll have questions like that, and you'll have answer choices saying, will the rate increase, decrease, or stay the same? Okay, that's when you need to know, understand, and remember the rate law. Okay, one thing we forgot to mention is rearrangement. So, rearrangement. Okay, 
So for SN1, uh, yes, you can do a rearrangement, and it's going to be in the form of a hydride or methyl. And for SN2, there is no uh, mechanism of rearrangement in SN2. So SN2 can't go from a secondary to a primary. It, it won't go to a uh, less stable position just to favor SN2 conditions. All right, so let me look at my notes if I'm missing anything that really pertains to SN1, SN2. So again, don't forget that ME stands for methyl and ET stands for ethyl. Um, other than that, I think that should be it for as far as SN1, SN2. Uh, we'll get into um, you know E1, E2, and all of those examples. Um, or like different conditions, and we'll talk about the table um, for E1 and E2 as well. And then we'll also get, get into some practice problems next week, uh, some ranking questions and some practice problems. So in the meantime, I do recommend, especially this unit, especially in this unit, uh, or starting as after unit one, uh, you really have to get into practice problems. It's, it's more important than ever because uh, you're just going to have a bunch of reactions over and over and over. There is some conceptual, obviously, but majority of it is going to be very, I guess, like mechanical and like hands-on a little bit, uh, where you're actively trying to figure out uh, how a reaction will uh, occur. So you're going to give a starting compound, uh, the substrate, uh, the reagent, uh, which is the nucleophile, and the substrate, which is the electrophile, and then you're, you have to draw the product. Uh, or in your case, it might be a multiple choice where you have to select the product. Um, so depending on, uh, so for exam sake, multiple choice can be a little bit easier because uh, the product is also given to you. Uh, but it can also be tricky because notice how I said uh, stereochemistry has, uh, or stereochemistry in, inverts for SN2. So you can definitely guarantee that there's going to be a wedge and a dash version of the answer. So those little things you do have to know. Uh, and here I'm scrolling up a little bit too, so you guys can see all of it. OK. All right, so thanks for coming uh, to this week's weekly review. I will see you guys next week.